Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Isaac Oram. I've been at Intel. I didn't put a, an intro in, but I've been at Intel since 1996, mostly in the biospace. And I'm mostly a UEFI person since the year 2000. I've been working on UEFI enabling, essentially. There have been a few other side projects, but uh, I hear tell that we're almost done with Legacy Boot, but I'm not confident yet. Um, anyway, so a lot of time in Intel, a lot of time in the bios firmware space, uh, mostly UEFI. And so the rather grandiose title today is the Open Platform Enabling Plans. Uh, and I'm going to get into, I guess, tying together some of the things we've seen in other sessions, Slim Boot, Min Platform, and our regular platform enabling. So the initial context that's driving much of this discussion is the Open Compute Project and their plans for open systems firmware. So I'll talk about that a little bit. I'll talk about our open source solutions, what we call or are tentatively calling the minimum viable platform, but what we're going to put as an open platform out into tianocore.org and elsewhere, and then a little bit of wrap up summary call to actions on our plans. The Open System Firmware Project is a part of the Open Compute Project, uh, headed by Ron Minich and Devendra Good. Uh, it is a work stream that's focused on the firmware side of Open Compute. The big focus area currently feels like it's around the boot firmware, the system firmware, the BIOS, the UEFA firmware, the bootloader, whatever you want to call it. I use a lot of those terms interchangeably to me. The firmware that initializes the main CPU, the main memory, those kinds of pieces. That's that's what I'm talking about for the most part. I'll talk about some of the other IP firmwares, I, the other system controllers a little bit, but mostly this is a UEFI firmware or BIOS context. The other contextual thing is we're mostly looking at this Linux boot model as the basis for the open system firmware. So multiple firmware initialization or hardware initialization pieces above the line once memory is initialized, a OS loader and an OS. And so we can see you know, whether it's the UEFI PEI doing hardware init or core boot ROM stage or U-boot SPL, it's going to have multiple hardware initialization options. And uh, while this picture shows Linux boot, you can also think of a UEFI payload in this box. You can think of other uh, Linux loaders um, so there are multiple solutions at multiple stages in this stack. But this is the basic model that Open System Firmware Workstream is talking about. So the main driving thing for today's discussion in our plans is around the Open Systems Firmware Ready logo discussion. And so this is essentially, the, the details will be worked out, but the objective is to have clear requirements for what uh, what matches, what is required to be open systems firmware, to be open compute projects, compatible firmware, to get a logo. So the key points is they want to have solutions. We want to have solutions that are based on open source firmware, still with opaque binary blobs like FSP, but fewer of those, and fundamentally open firmware, open boot firmware. Uh, the year, the target is 2021, so we've got a, not immediately, but a reasonably short time frame for the server community. Um, and the key thing in here is it really is targeted at multiple solutions. So we spend a lot of time talking about x86 solutions, Intel solutions, UEFI firmware, and core boot, but it is really much broader than that. So those are the, the key points I would bring up about that. The key schedule timeline for the OSF proposal is um, was started in March of this year at the Open Compute Project Global Summit. We sketched out the basic timeline. Uh, today we're talking or in, in the Open Compute Project uh, Regional Summit in Amsterdam. We'll talk a little bit more details about the plans. In March of next year, we're looking to have the pieces in place such that open system firmware can be provided, but it's still not yet required. September of next year, we're looking to have systems coming from manufacturers that they may ship with a traditional firmware solution or a full firmware solution, but you'll be able to put open systems firmware on that. So that means the hardware vendors like Intel, we need to provide all the pieces, ODM and OEM need to build systems, but they won't be shipping yet. At that point, we're expecting to have systems start to show up 
and we can finalize the requirements. That's the, the discussion. And that gives six months to meet the requirements before March of 2021, where it's possible to get a system that ships out of the factory with open systems firmware. So that's the basic context and schedule that's driving our Intel open deliverables for this so that our customers and our ODMs can meet those, those timeframes. Is it boarding to take pictures of your own documents? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ron actually wrote the document link below or started it at least. <laughs> I just like seeing an Intel logo on it. <laughs> uh oh. Um, all right. So now we'll talk a little bit about the range of solutions that Intel has to feed the open source. And so as we look at this picture on the left side, the open source pieces are going to show up. On the right source, the closed source uh, proprietary pieces are going to show up. And the X scale, from my perspective, is basically as you go from left to right, you're going to get more flexibility and more complexity coming along with that. More features, but also um, a lot more system firmware. So it looks like a spectrum like this. We've got core boot as the most basic, slim bootloader right up there, the same level of this is just booting the hardware, just configuring the hardware and getting out of the way. Then you start to add UD, UEFI payloads or things that build the system from where they, they get more complicated, that offer more driver models and pieces like that. The MIN platform is expected to come in a little more complicated than the payload. It's going to have SMM still. It's going to have security features, authenticated boot, and things that you won't find necessarily in the UEFI payload. Um, and then we've got our traditional reference platform, our enabling platform, which is mostly closed source, but with some open source tianocore.org stuff. And then we have customer products built on the top of that. So this is our basic picture of the spectrum of open and closed solutions that Intel's enabling. Um, and our primary vehicle for enabling these is the reference platforms for a given uh, silicon chipset, uh, given platform. So we're looking to have a spectrum of options available, and you've got to talk to us privately for, for specific roadmaps and what products support what. Not everything, not every platform, not every chipset will have all of these options available. Um, for example, enabling made sure that I point out that we don't have core boot, direct core boot enabling from Intel for server silicon at this time. We do for client, for many client products, but um, the silicon, we still don't have a plan in place to do direct core boot enabling. Um, but we'll talk about the FSP and we'll talk about the MIM platform and how we can utilize those to enable core boot and other answers. Um, so the thrust of our solutions are really to uh, start taking steps to reduce complexity. At this point in the evolution of UEFI, we've got UEFI saturating much of the market. We have lots of UEFI solutions. We have lots and lots of features based on UEFI. And what we need to do is start to reduce the complexity because there's a lot, uh, a lot that goes with the, the current answer. So we're looking to reduce the complexity. MIM platform is a big part of that, making features more modular so they can plug into MIM platform or the full platform. That'll be another thrust of upcoming years. Um, and then we have another focus to move both of these things into the more open space um, over time. So those are the two, I think, things, trends that we see in the firmware enabling for Intel is we've got to reduce the complexity and we've got to get more of it into the open. Um, so in summarizing the different things that's coming from Intel, the slim bootloader, the MIM platform, and then the full reference platform, I think a couple key messages are the, the MIM platform is the newest thing. It's to fit between the slim bootloader and the full reference platform that's closed. So the slim bootloader is open. It is statically linked together, a single image program. And the MIM platform is still UEFI, still EDK2, and PI architecture compliant, and has a dynamic driver model and all those pieces. Um, but it's a lot less than the full BIOS. And then the full system firmware is still there, the full reference platform. Uh, all of these, we're looking to leverage the FSP to provide the one set of silicon support. One of the constraints for us as a company is we don't like, uh, we spend a lot of money on validating memory configuration and memory initialization code. And so it's very difficult for us to support multiple answers in that space. So all of these solutions are going to be based off of FSP. And the net result is we, we're looking to have three options. You can build a completely custom solution with the slim bootloader. You can build a, an EDK2 solution from the bottom up with the minimum features and add more into it. Or you can take the full reference solution, 
full IBV solution, biosmender solution, and reduce it down to your needs. So that's the, the spectrum of enabling that we're actively working towards. Um, so talking a little bit more about the MIM platform, if you saw Michael's presentation earlier, he covered this, but the MIM platform approach was to break the boot into stages that are both reflective of how we bring up a new system as a team and as how a system bootstraps itself as it boots, as it goes through the boot process, bringing up the hardware. So initially stage one of the MIM platform is to get debug up and going, get a serial port, get caches RAM, get a basic environment for doing memory initialization. Stage two gets us to memory functional. Stage three gets us to a UEFI shell with a basic just serial console, um, text input, text output. Stage four then adds basic ACPI tables and the pieces we need to boot an OS. Stage five turns on the authenticated boot and security features that we need to be ubiquitous as we go forward. Um, we see that as, as table stakes for playing in the silicon game anyway. Everyone has some sort of hardware root of trust, hardware boot solution that we have to deal with. Um, and we want to enable that, whether it's boot guard or whatever. And then advanced feature selection is where more things can plug in to build out the final system. So this is the basic MIM platform architecture. Uh, we've organized the code around these stages and organize the functionality around these stages and try to make each of them useful without any of the others. So admittedly, the first stage of just getting a serial port up and running isn't the most interesting thing you can do with firmware. But if you just need to get through memory, uh, stage one and stage two will get you through a, our system with the silicon initialized, the memory running. And then we could, at that point, jump to other things. We could jump to Linux boot from there. We could jump to Linux boot from later. We're envisioning those kinds of options being available to people, uh, depending on how much or how little of the MIM platform they want to leverage. So the idea is that each of these stages is distinctly usable. Um, and then there's another piece that we haven't really talked about because we don't have much of the infrastructure there, but the envisioning, envisioned answer is there's also a stage seven where after you've got all the features that come as packaged things, you go through optimization stage and you, uh, if you saw the Fiano conversation, you remove all the Dixie drivers you don't care about, you remove all the PIMs you don't care about, um, supposing you need something from USB, but you don't need the USB mass storage driver, we're going to have a USB feature that tries to plug in all of them and then just go through with the optimization and kill the USB mass storage device because you don't need that one. So that's the, the basic MIM platform model that we're working towards. And then, uh, so when we look at that and then the full reference platform, the full reference platform will eventually be the MIM platform with all the rest of the UEFI stuff that we use for silicon validation, for customer enabling, uh, setup browsers for doing configuration and those kinds of built-in things. Those, those all show up um, as advanced features or as proprietary features on top of this basic, uh, this, this open baseline. Um, talking about the relationships of these things and from another perspective, on the bottom we have the common building blocks and this is where I'm gonna start start evolving from the MIM platform, which is the, the IA system firmware to the full uh, integrated firmware image or the full platform, which has the ME firmware, um, ACM TXT firmware, if you're familiar with Intel Trusted Execution Technology, the, uh, those kinds of pieces. So in, in the base level, we have common building blocks, a MIM platform and a motherboard port of that. We've got the Intel FSP binary for silicon initialization. We've got microcode. Uh, binaries for the CPU. We've got the Intel um, server platform services binary, also known as the ME binary. So we've got all these different pieces uh, and we're envisioning OpenBMC as the, the BMC solution for open compute. We've got these basic pieces that are common to all of the answers. On top of that, or if you add a few more pieces that make it a usable system, then you get a minimum viable platform. And so the key attributes of that is it's the set of building blocks with minimum functionality and then open source MIM platform code and opaque binary blobs for the rest of the pieces uh, initially. And then the key timing for the minimum viable platform is we can start open sourcing things after the products launch. So we can't do open source development at this time, we're limited, but once we launch a new processor, a new platform, we expect we're looking to flip the minimum platform port open and the binary FSPs and these other pieces open.
So they'll be freely available, downloadable, and redistributable. Um, on top of that, we've got the full reference platform. This will be closed. This is the platform and development and validation the vehicle that we use to build all these things. It has lots of features, and it's the traditional ecosystem enabling tool. So that's the, the basic stack of how the full platform, MIM platform, and the, the building blocks work together. So in the Venn diagram picture, uh, the key thing I want to stress here is the FSP is the same throughout all of these. The MIM platform is looking to be the same throughout all of these. The binary pieces are looking, we're not having multiple flavors of these things. It is consistently adding things on. They're not 100% supersets, but for the most part, 95% uh, plus of the source code will be shared and reused, and that's the, the model for these things. Um, so a couple notes on that. The minimum viable platform is probably not an actual deliverable. It's probably going to be posted a little more ad hoc than that and likely won't show up on platform roadmaps when you're talking to Intel or published material. You've got to look at the, the actual platform information and extrapolate that, okay, at, at this platform launch, these pieces are going to come open. Um, the MIM viable platform is an initial open source target. We don't believe that a fully it's it, that it's going to be a fully featured solution for quite some time. So we're expected to require proprietary code um, and or additional binaries to have a really useful system. The minimum functionality is not your minimum PC functionality or your minimum enterprise server functionality or even necessarily your minimal enterprise uh, your minimal cloud server at this time or hyperscale server so we're missing things in manageability um, updatability those kinds of pieces those those we're looking to have built on the communities as we get things out into the open um, and then the other note to facilitate the spread of, of this, we're looking to control the rate of change in the FSP specification. We feel like with the FSP 2.1 specification, we've started to have a little fragmentation in the ecosystem. We've got 1.0 and 1.1 and 2.0 and 2.1 versions of the FSP. So we're really going to try to stabilize and get all the binaries to the same level before we embark on the next round of change. So it's our, our basic direction to keep that stable for a while so we can get it into use in Corbett, Ubu and all of our answers. Um, and so I, the, the last note on that that I skipped over is, for the near future, if we do need additional functionality for servers that's proprietary, we're looking to use the UEFI modularity to deliver that so we can publish Dixie drivers and PIMs. And it's not a great answer, but you can do something like core boot plus FSP plus a UEFI payload plus a proprietary binary blob of UEFI stuff. And we can build those answers if we need those until we reach a more proper open system from our fully functional answer. All right, so talking about our part of this. So we've got the context, we've got the open systems from our timeline, and we've got this basic target of a minimum viable platform. Where we are right now is we've got some of the common building blocks posted onto uh, various places. So we've got the microcode, we've got Intel TXT binaries, and we've got Intel FSP for a variety of platforms. We need to start getting those out there for more server platforms, so that'll be the, the next focus. But we're, we've got uh, examples and the licensing, and we've been working through that. We're working currently on the SPS licensing and tools that we need for the MIM platform um, to get those going. And so right now it is not one thing. It is a mix of different versions and different pieces, and it's mostly just showing, demonstrating that we've got this piece open, a, a redistributable and available. We've got the next one coming. So uh, it's a mix of MIM platform proof of concepts and ports and things like that. So we're not really expecting until the next platform generation for servers to have a fully integrated, fully usable uh, proof of concept and, and baseline to start from. So the next steps, we are developing that proof of concept for the next generation of Xeon SP servers. And we're looking to get, and we're developing the MIM platform ports for our reference platform. So the, the basic model there is we can do a reference platform and then derivative board designs can leverage that to quickly produce their own open board ports. Um, after we get to, as after products start launching, um, so this next time frame is, is the next six months to, to the next March milestone for OCP, Open Systems Firmware. So the, at that point, at the next milestone, we looked at the committed schedule for the 
Intel platform deliverables. So if you talk to us uh, right now, we don't have the schedules, but we're working on them. When, by March, we're looking to have all the schedules for our next generation of Xeon SP nailed down so people can build their products based off of them their, and their plans. Um, and then at the future time when OSF is required, we are we feel like we're on track. We feel like we're making progress towards the commercially available Intel platforms having and able to meet the OSF logo based on our current trends. So that's that's really the key message today. We're doing them platforms. We're doing FSPs for the future Xeon SP products. Uh, we don't have a lot of detail. We don't have timelines yet. That's much more under the, the private disclosure discussions. We can talk about those things. But as a general direction, we really want to say that we are working towards this milestone and enabling this for our partners and our development ecosystem. All right, so a few notes on the deliverables. Again, product launch is the key dependency for us. We really can't push things into the open or work on them publicly until those, those silicon products launch. Uh, we, have some, we have some concerns and risks about FSP API mode for multi-socket functionality. We've got a lot of desktop and a lot of client systems and single socket uh, SOC-based server systems that are using the FSP. We believe that we'll get the FSP functional for multi-socket systems without any issues, but there is still a little it, uh, asterisk. It hasn't been done yet. It's not mature. So all statements are, are forward-looking on the schedule because we've been burned before. It, it looks really easy until you start debugging some of those multi-socket issues. Um, but in general, uh, we, are move we believe we're moving forward well. We've got good initial data and those kinds of things. Um, and then the other key limitation is we don't currently have a plan to support system management mode functionality. So this shows up in a variety of manageability and update features in the server space today. Um, in the client space, updates are largely driven through capsule updates or some other uh, reboot-based mechanism. In the server space, it's still typical traditional BIOS update where you run a program that goes into SMM and reprovisions the flash image. And so there's a fair amount of work to do to get away from that model into um, an SMM free flow uh, for things. So, so those are some of the, the limitations that I want to keep uh, in people's minds that we've got still a lot of SMM dependencies today in the firmware, in the server space. Um, and we still got some risks associated with the multi-socket functionality. Um, but basically, that's it. The OSF Ready logo program is expected to happen, is expected to drive uh, open systems firmware into the server space and drive solutions. And we believe we can support that. We are using the FSP as our primary silicon enabling vehicle for these efforts and for a a range, a spectrum of, of firmware solutions. And we're, we're producing MIM platforms as the open enabling version of EDK2. So the, the call to action, uh, learn more about the OSF work. There's the open systems firmware website and there's a variety of documents going with it. And then the MIM platform stuff is out there, largely instantiated on the client side right now, but with the next generation of products, server versions will go up on tianocore.org. The specification is there. It's very much a draft specification. We're looking to evolve it to meet everyone's needs. We publish what we think we need, what we know we need to align with our validation efforts and our silicon development. And from there, I think we can, uh, we can take it in a lot of directions. So uh, engagement on the MIM platform specification is definitely welcome. And with that, I'd like to open it up to Q&A. Uh, late last year, there was a lot of press around some uh, thoughts that Intel might open source the FSP. Is that, A, a was that ever planned? And B, may that happen in the future? Um, it depends on what you mean by planned, and so I don't feel like I can answer that in any useful official way. But yes, we are still looking at that. We don't have concrete plans at this time. So there's there's a lot of things that have to go. As you, you look at Ron's 20-year history in the intro, um, the Intel has moved uh, a couple different ways over history. And so I, I feel like we've got a lot of momentum moving towards more open specs and more open things. but. The, there's still a lot of work to do. So it's it's not something that we would talk about a time frame for yet. 
by any means. Uh, could you please shed some light? What are the issues getting FSP to work on uh, multi-socket configuration? It's it's a risk statement. There's a greater than greater than 25% chance that we'll hit some hard issues uh, in making it useful. So when we look at the memory initialization in the server code, it is multi-socket today. Um, and it's a very specialized magic hardware, low low performance buses and so we just we haven't worked that out we're not we're not worried about the bootloaders edk2 and core boot both have long histories in hpc and server and enterprise and things it's you know is there some limitation to the fsp spec is there some limitation to the implementation we have in it so it's purely a risk management statement to say we need to be a little cautious if you're if you're betting your business on building something off of an fsp that's going to show up in nine months that's probably a high risk bet since we just we haven't done it yet that's that's the main message there. Uh, we don't we haven't hit any issues. We've got FSBs that are booting multi socket in their early functionality, um, and so that's we haven't hit anything yet. But uh, our our multi socket initialization and our memory initialization are complicated endeavors. So, so you mentioned um, redistributable components for Intel uh, TXT. Uh, what does it mean? So do you mean? Uh, BIOS ACM or SMT yes. ACM? Yes, so there are, uh, the question, what did I mean by Intel TXT binaries? So the BIOS ACM binaries that do the, that hook into the fit table and do the initial boot guard authentication, we can make those available to do measurement. I mean, they have a different functionality, but yes. So what would be the license? Would the license be like microcode and FSP? Yes. That's yes. great. That's, That's very good news. So that, that happened a month or two ago, maybe, maybe longer than that. And we're working on the ME currently to get so that. What, what platforms will be covered with that? Uh, so the first one we posted is Cascade Lake, and it will be going forward. So we, are, we don't expect to have all the pieces for Cascade Lake. We expect to have all the pieces for the next generation. OK, so this will be only for newer platforms, not yes. anything else. Yeah. OK, we, we have a difficulty going backwards at this point of view, <laughs> at this point in time. Uh, what was your timetable on actually aligning all of your offerings to FSP21? Oh, that's a good question. I should have seen that. I don't have a timetable. Uh, so so we're pausing new spec development and letting everything catch up. So the, the long pulls tend to be the server products. Um, but uh, the, the embedded teams... May also have some projects that are still 2.0 and things like that. I think I think we're catching up. We've got the initial 2.1s out like there for client, but I don't have a hard time. Three there. years? Oh, it'll be less than that. I'm pretty sure. Okay, because it has some severe limitations. Okay. Yep. Um, tell me if this is off topic, but. Um, the FSPs take a long time to init memory, and you you keep saying how complicated it is. Um, is that going to get more and more complicated and, and slow uh, forever, uh, or is it going to settle down? And is it possible to have a memory in it that's targeted perhaps not quite so, you know, getting the, the maximum possible uh, performance out of a system, just have a slightly crappy memory in it? <laughs> That is an excellent question. That's what we were talking about at lunch. Uh, there are definitely segments that would make that useful, but I am not aware of any good enough memory in it things in the server space. Our driver is definitely performance and bandwidth and throughput and performance and bandwidth and throughput. And uh, we're trying to make boot speed and we've got lots of great feedback that, you know, systems need to boot in less than minutes. Um, but the, the, driver does appear to be performance. And so it, it's a balance for us, it's a struggle for us. So uh, I don't know any concrete plans. Um, I'm fairly pessimistic that we can really make things simpler. I think you know we can, we can make efforts like MIM platform, but if I look forward five or 10 years, I see Moore's Law continuing. I see 10X more firmware being more likely than half as much firmware. And I don't know how to. I don't know how to really get off that treadmill. I see a lot of positive effort, and I think we do things to simplify it along the way. But ultimately, um, 
Uh, I'm not aware of anything that's going to be a magic bullet for that. So we are adding new memory technologies. The, the non-volatile memory has continued to increase the complexity and what's going on in system memory topologies. So uh, I don't have any particular good news on that front, but I also might, I wouldn't be involved. So if, where Intel is doing that, uh, I'm not the right person. I'm more the product firmware deployment side, not the cutting edge memory development side. So. Take my answer with a grain of salt. Um, I just remembered that you expressed frustration at, at a future where there will be, could be some platforms on FSP one and one point one and two point two point zero and two point one. Did that mean that maybe there would be a desire to bring everything up to two point one eventually? Yeah. So we'd we'd like to let the let all of our things catch up, but. Uh, it's a it's a general just simplicity and uh, simplifying core boot and, and other bootloaders supporting the multiple versions. I mean, the specs are pretty reasonably um, compatible and related, like the old stuff didn't get thrown away. Um, so I think it's completely reasonable for a bootloader to support multiple generations of the FSP. But at the same time, we don't want to always have a, oh, here's the next spec coming fragment and ecosystem. We would like to really get the the uh, our roadmap complete more, rather than have more applications. But I mean, it, we're, we're open. I, I think it's a general directional statement based on our history with UEFI and how, how fragmented we let things get um, in that experience. So, But I think that question is about the trailing window. I mean, you're not taking old platforms and moving them to 2.1, you're looking at your products and getting them all up to 2.1, correct? Is correct. your statement, yes. Um, we keep on hearing that memory training is very complicated, and maybe it is, but there are system which um, may not require all the complexity to train the memory, like system with solder down memory, is there any plan to maybe open how training is supposed to work in this configuration so some customers might be able to implement their own training or like reduced version of training or something like that so that we wouldn't have to depend on this thing which is supposed to cover a thousand thousands of different configurations of chips so uh, i'm not aware of any plans at this time so it, you know we're, we're working it as a general direction to be more open with even the silicon stuff and the document one of the things that came out of this conference is thinking about the documentation as well as an answer. You know, we don't necessarily, we've been thinking very strongly reference code for the last decade or two at Intel um, and moving from purely spec-based, NDA spec-based enabling to here is functional code. And that's been the, the last 10 years or so. And I think it's an interesting thing to bring up that there is the mix in the open world where we can just make the documents available and maybe we need to do more of that. But right now, my experience is we've been very focused on reference implementations and binaries that people can use and not so much publishing specs. So uh, I'm not aware of any plans. I think it's an interesting direction. I think there's opportunity there, but uh, we don't have plans to my knowledge at this point. Let me uh, turn the earlier question around. Other than you know asking at conferences like this, what's happening? What can we as you know Intel users do to help push Intel into this direction of more open documentation, you know, more low level init, uh, such that you know, as he mentioned, you know, we may not necessarily have the full set of requirements, but you know, we want to get a you know minimal firmware product shipping. Um, you know, where at Intel is the right pressure point to you know, push push in that direction? Um, I'm going to give a pretty generic answer to that one. So there's there's a couple places. You know, you can you can work with us on the open piano core and other places like that, and you can work with us in a collaborative way on the the pre-launch development. And and I think that's a thing that we need to work on going forward. Is is this constraint of being open post-launch uh, 
is a real problem if we can't collaborate effectively pre-launch. So how do we create some sort of quasi pre-launch collaboration where people can have input? Because it does us no good if we open the silicon code and then tell you, yeah, none of your changes are acceptable or valid. We're not, you know, there is no upstream path. So that's a, that's a hard problem that we're only in the early stages of thinking about. You know, we've got a, a step one that's get, you know, get the information public, a step two that's figure out how to use it in some sort of effective way. So. Um, nothing concrete there, but the, the feedback uh, is welcome. Um, and I think working with us collaboratively in some way of, of committing things back to us, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one, point to point thing might be the first steps. But yeah, that's that's the essential thing we're going to do. If we, if we are ever to get to some sort of open thing, we have to be better at taking feedback in. Um, and right now, just simple schedules don't line up and things like that. So it's very difficult. Yeah, one thing uh, regarding SMM, you said we want to thin down SMM. That's one thing, but you said uh, there are no plans to support uh, SMM and FSP. Uh, is it in the long run? Is it a time thing? Or? Uh, right now, it's a time, effort, and priority thing. We don't have we don't have the the people working on a different answer. We don't have the time to intercept the different answer. So we're working on the PRM. So we've you know we've seen Sarathi Jay Kumar talk about that at the OCP Global Summit and a little bit mentioned it here. But yeah, so we're working to reduce the SMM and I think there's a lot of consensus that it would be nice to have systems without SMM at all um, or severely limited and constrained SMM. Uh, I think, yeah. well, I won't go. Yeah. So yeah, so we're looking to reduce the SMM and yeah. we're looking to provide some alternative answers and that's another area where there is probably a good opportunity to move things from the BIOS space to the OS space. So, so Linux boot is one big place where we can move functionality out of the BIOS system firmware into a more OS level and then runtime. I mean, yeah. from the very beginning, we everyone has hated UEFI runtime. Like we don't want BIOS code running at runtime. We want OS is running at runtime. But for whatever reason, some of these capabilities and features have utility that that keeps them around. So that's that's the fight: is reduce the need, reduce as much as we can the runtime footprint of firmware. Um, it's a security challenge anywhere you can interface directly with the BIOS, anywhere you can start changing system configuration functionality. So we'd we'd like to reduce that. Um, and so it's just a, for the next generation of platforms, I think we have the, the feature set we have in the SMM space. But we're working PRM, we're working on offloading things to other controllers, and we'd like to see Linux boot take more of those pieces and, and OS level drivers take more of those pieces. Okay. And the other thing is, FSP, does it have mandatory pieces uh, that are uh, uniform across all the customers, or will there be configuration options that people can further strip them down to their platform needs? Yeah, so um, I think we definitely like to go in the latter direction of having the ability to strip things down. I think Fiano obviously demonstrates something that was always intended there that you could remove the tools. There's there's a tool in pianocore.org, FFMT, that's the same thing, pull out modules and things. So I'd like to use that modularity rather than a build time feature flag modularity. And I know there's some size penalties to that, but it's, a, it's an incremental step um, where we can align on things and we can have uh, we can do um, cryptographic hashes of FSPs and have known answers and things like that if we have some some consistency to how we do that versus builds. So uh, we are also looking at bringing back reproducible builds, if you're familiar with that, but two different systems, two different build targets should be able to build the same binary. We'd very much like to get that capability back. Um, we had it and at some point we just stopped testing for it and lost it. So. That's All right. part of it. I'm afraid we have to cut it here because we have to make it. Uh, thank you very much again. Round of applause. Thank you, everyone.